Hello, everyone. Uh, warm welcome to the session that is going to talk about network governance and circular economy hubs. And of course, as well as of the power of our networks on the ground throughout the network governance. And another topic that we are going to touch are transition brokers. So uh, we are very happy that we have you with us and we will introduce a very rich program today and something what relates very much what we are facing and what has been discussed already yesterday and this morning. So how we stakeholders on the ground experience circular economy and how we collaborate with different partners and with different segments. So my name is Ladea Godina Kushir. I am the co-founder of Circular. Uh, I'm the co-chair of the Circular Economy Platform, as well as the founder and executive director of Circular Change. So together with Freak One Eight, we are chairing this amazing platform that has the ambition to become the network of networks. And therefore, this particular topic is so important for everyone, for every single participant, and also for those who are not yet familiar with what our European circular economy platform can offer. So within our leadership group, what we did the last year was that we tried to understand better actually who we are and what we do as the front runners of the circular transformation on the ground. So we did a survey, uh, a little one, uh, to understand what are those topics that are most relevant for the front runners and for, as I said, for different uh, hubs and organizations working with circular economy. And we figured out that actually we are sharing uh, very similar, let's say, ambitions as well as we are facing similar burdens or obstacles. So um, the position of the hubs uh, in different countries is different, of course, and also how they're organized, whether they're public entities or private public or private completely, as well as what is highly on the agenda. Is it more related to uh, support the business in the transformation or is it more uh, focused on that, how to actually connect different stakeholders and help them to understand the opportunities of circular economy? So that is what we did throughout the survey. And uh, we will ask you as well to let us know who you are today with the first poll that we are going to launch. Uh, the next thing that was important for the leadership group was also that we collaborated with experts uh, like Professor Jacqueline Kramer, who is with us today, as well as with Dr. Petra Kunkel. And they in, uh, introduced to us different aspects of that what is uh, happening um, among different st uh, different hubs around the globe. So Professor Jacqueline Kramer will introduce that later on, what uh, her survey actually and her research showed. And Petra Kunkel touched a little bit more what is the role of the leadership. So uh, now you have the poll and we are asking you who you are. So please, in the meantime, while I'm explaining our achievements or our uh, results, uh, please feel free to say who you are, to click what kind of entity you are. So back to results of the leadership group and of the platform. So uh, we, as Frick uh, already in, uh, mentioned this morning, we organized a great event in Dubai during Dubai Expo. So this was, uh, circular europe days where we shown what we as europe are doing in the field of circular economy and there were four pavilions uh so the dutch uh, the irish the slovenian and the finnish who were presenting different topics so this was really a kind of a flagship of this year or in the last year uh, because we really want to bridge europe with the rest of the world and of course, uh, I have to mention the book that Professor Kramer published based on uh, the research uh, done among uh, the hubs, not only Europe, but also out of the Europe and the position of the transition brokers. So this is what we are going to highlight today as well. What is actually our role and what how we can contribute? And uh, to conclude with that, where we stand, it was also important that we signed uh, a joint statement that we as a European circular economy stakeholder platform would really like to collaborate with others in this endeavor to make circular economy a mainstream. And what we see nowadays, and particularly with the war that started, 
is how important it is, uh, how important are the competencies that we have and not only the competencies, but also this uh, agility and this knowledge and experience in that how to connect, how to mobilize quickly uh, different stakeholders and how to adjust also value chains. It was hard last two years due to the COVID. Now it's even harder with the war that is happening. So our role on the ground is becoming even more relevant. So at this point, I would like to conclude this introduction and really move to our first speaker, distinguished guest. So Professor Jacqueline Kramer is with us. Uh, she is from Utrecht University, member of the Amsterdam Economic Board, board chair of Holland Circular Hotspot and former Dutch Minister of Housing, Spatial Planning and the Environment. And we are very pleased and proud that we have her with us. And Professor Kramer, I would like to give the floor to you and ask you to share uh, with us what are the findings of your research. And we have a very special moment because you are also introducing your brand new book on that, how to implement circular economy. Please, the screen is yours and I'm more than happy that we have you with us. Thank you. So much, Ladea. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm really pleased to launch indeed my new book today. It's called Building a Circular Future, 10 Takeaways for Global Changemakers. Actually, this book is a, a sequel of a previous book I wrote, uh, which is called How Network Governance Can Power the Circular Economy. And that book uh, was uh, actually a book based on my Dutch experiences. One of the main conclusions of the book was that we need two types of governance, namely the governance you are all familiar with, namely the uh, public governance, the role of the government in developing policies on circular economy and uh, also uh, put in practice all kinds of government instruments. Besides that, we need network governance. Why is that the case? Well, as you all know, circular economy is a huge transition, a system change from a linear to a circular economy. And that requires to get the implementation of a circular economy uh, done in a network of partners. No company, no organization can realize circular economy alone. We need to cooperate in networks. And in order to make sure that these networks become effective, we need to govern these networks. And this steering uh, of networks I call network governance. Well, um, uh, in order to understand not only the, uh, how uh, network governance can work in the Netherlands, but understand how the joint application of public and network governance can power the circular economy in different political and social cultural context, I made a next study and that study is indeed uh, uh, summarized in the book that I launched today. And uh, in order to answer the question uh, raised in the in new book, I interviewed global change makers uh, from uh, 16 different countries. And it was wonderful to interview them. And uh, some of you are also present. One of uh, you are also uh, interviewing. And what I liked very much is that we discussed how public and network governance can work in your country. Based on the interviews, I summarized uh, my main findings in 10 takeaways. And the rest of my uh, short presentation will be a sneak preview of these 10 takeaways. Let me start with the first one. Well, the um, uh, interviewees all uh, agreed upon the statement that combining public and network governance can enhance the transition to a circular economy. Secondly, 
network governance needs transition brokers. That are people that are working as inter, uh, independent intermediaries and can uh, make sure that uh, parties with different stakes uh, can be aligned and that the process of um, meeting the goals needed is accelerated by the steering of an independent intermediary called transition broker. Third, the receptivity to network governance depends on the social, cultural and political context. And fourth, governance of a circular economy is country specific. Let me make that even uh, more clear to you based on the next uh, ten takeaways uh, that I uh, formulated. And uh, the fifth one is effective governance of a circular economy depends on three general key determinants. First, leadership of the government. Secondly, involvement of actors, particularly industry. And uh, finally, the receptivity to network governance. And moreover, uh, there are always specific drivers that can enhance effective governance. And that also depends on the specific country. For instance, market pressure through uh, supranational policies, for instance, from the EU, can affect also the policies in, for instance, Brazil. And, and uh, the waste policies of China also influence Europe and Australia. So you see that there are triggers that make uh, that, that that we uh, in specific countries have to act upon triggers outside our own national borders. Furthermore, there are specific companies, international companies, that are committed to promote uh, the circular economy worldwide. And these companies are often triggers in, in, in uh, specific countries to uh, really get circular economy off the ground. Seventh point is utilizing the strong aspects of countries' uh, governance and mobilizing the most relevant actors and adequate drivers increases the effectiveness of circular uh, initiatives. Let me uh, explain that in, in the following slide, which summarizes everything I have said until now. We have public governance, network governance. Very important is governmental leadership, whether it's strong or weak. Uh, the receptivity to network governance and the degree high, medium or low. And further, okay, <laughs> of uh, industry, local government. This is a shame. And uh, yeah. Yeah. the involvement of industry is uh, very, very crucial. It's working. Finally, the, uh, uh, you will be presenting with your webcam on, right? Sorry? You will be presenting with your webcam? Yes. Okay, good. Then um, I will also, can I just forward your call to my colleague Alexandro, who is actually responsible for that? This is just. Daria, can you switch off? Forwarding it, right? I, One moment, please. Check here. Okay, okay. Please, I'm making the water. Daria, switch off the mic because we cannot hear Professor Kramer. Daria. Yeah, just Kramer, I'm so sorry, and the others as well. We obviously have a problem. Someone is logging in. Uh, okay, let's try now. Professor Kramer, are you still there? Yes, I'm still there. Uh, I will uh, pick up again the slide uh, effectiveness of the governance of circular economy. I summarized we need public governance, network governance, and uh, very important is, uh, in the first place, governmental leadership. Secondly, receptivity to network governance. And furthermore, involvement of industry and other uh, actors like local government, NGOs and citizens. And finally, drivers for network and public governance that are specific for each country. 
Well, uh, if we put that all together, there are four main avenues that can be distinguished to move to a circular economy. The first uh, starting point is when the government leadership on circular economy is strong, the involvement of industry is medium to high and network governance is also uh, medium to high in terms of receptivity. The prospects for developing circular economy are in this case quite positive uh, in the sense that the conditions are favorable. But of course, also in these countries, several obstacles should be removed to get all actors on board. The second uh, starting point is when governmental leadership is limited, but the involvement of industry and network governance are medium to high. Uh, in that case, starting circular uh, economy is relatively easy. Why? Because proactive companies can start circular economy. But acceleration requires the mobilization of additional drivers and actors, including the government. So you can start, but to scale up, uh, you will encounter problems which need to be solved by mobilizing other actors and drivers. The third uh, uh, starting point is the case where the governmental leadership is strong, but the involvement of industry and also the receptivity to network governance uh, are low. And in that case, starting circular economy is relatively easy because the, the government can implement policies. However, uh, in order to get them in, uh, implemented and work, we need support uh, from relevant actors. Uh, and that means that uh, also in this case, you need network governance to mobilize these actors. And finally, you have the situation where the government leadership is limited and also the involvement of industry and network governance is low. Well, in that uh, case, starting circular economy is quite complicated, but be sure also there, there are possibilities to kick off um, circular economy by first movers uh, in industry or, uh, for instance, uh, within NGOs or uh, elsewhere, local governments. But of course, the mobilization of additional drivers and actors is very important, including the, the government, in order to be able to scale up. Well, uh, the ninth uh, takeaway is that in, in order to implement circular economy in your country, uh, you can, of course, start and uh, think, OK, now I'm on the right uh, track. But it is very, very uh, important to also reflect regularly on the path you take, because it might be that there are other ways to achieve your goals. And if you are too fixed on what you do, you can't uh, change uh, the, the, the uh, course anymore. And that is in terms of transition, uh, not very uh, uh, well good to do because because it's, it's important to become and stay flexible. Finally, uh, I uh, like to uh, say that the last takeaway is uh, that we need, need to join forces and that it's important also to work together uh, globally in order to exchange uh, our views and experiences and make sure that that network of global change makers helps us all to implement circular economy in our own country. The um, digital version of my book uh, can be downloaded free of charge. Uh, and you see here on the slides the websites uh, that uh, you can uh, use. And I hope that we uh, can discuss the content of the book, not only today, but also in the future. Thank you so much. And now I like to hand over the first copy of the book to you, Emmanuela uh, Meijer uh, from the European Commission. And uh, I'm really pleased to just send it to you digitally and hand it over. And uh, thank you for the time that you spent with us to uh, also respond to the book. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Kramer. 
I, I've got my printed uh, copy as well here at the European Commission. And uh, on behalf of the European Commission, I would like to thank you uh, which, uh, for your book, which really highlights the importance of uh, network governance and will be a source of uh, inspiration. We have heard yesterday Ellen MacArthur, and she told us that we needed to move fast and scale up the transition uh, from a linear to a semicolon economy. And this clearly cannot happen if each company feels isolated in its move uh, towards the circular economy, if each citizen is looking for ways to play her or his role, um, if a city looks for ways to become greener but doesn't find any good practices, if students look for ways to get trained on the circular economy, uh, but cannot find the right university, the right book, and the right research opportunities. So clearly, we need to be connected. We need to help each other and to share knowledge and good practices uh, to give a space to everyone who wants to speak out about circular economy. How do we do it at uh, the level of the European Union? First of all, I think that we needed a sense of direction, what you call leadership. And the European Union did this with the Circular Economy Action Plan uh, in 2020 under the European Green Deal, using its extraordinary governance that unites more than 500 million citizens. The European Parliament, the Council having 27 member states, uh, the European Commission, the Economic and Social Committee, uh, the Committee of the Regions, all agreed on the plan ahead. And this is an ambitious plan to stress the importance of product design, first and foremost, to support sustainable consumption, to modernize waste legislation with a focus on the key value chains. This means designing uh, EU legislation and mobilizing EU funds uh, for that. But we needed more than the sense of direction. We needed mobilization from all and always this ability to uh, pass the words on the importance of the circular economy. And I think this is uh, what we created uh, through the circular economy stakeholder platform where the Economic and Social Committee and the European Commission opened a space giving the infrastructure to uh, large stakeholders organizations to drive the change. And so behind the platform, we are very lucky to have 24 network organizations which are raising the interests of everyone across the European Union. So, these 24 organizations are our ambassadors across the European Union on circular economy. They have organized many EU circular talks digitally to keep the connections in these COVID times. We have more than 700 best practices coming from all over Europe. We have built the knowledge. We have developed circular economy roadmaps. We are with this conference giving another opportunity to everyone to meet and we need to develop our social uh, media uh, to get uh, connected. We had very vibrant examples of how this community can get mobilized in, um, in light of the big challenges we, we face. La Deia referred to the Dubai Expo where we had a great uh, delegation um, you know, having, bringing the European uh, flag on, on circular economy. But we were also very much present at the Climate uh, COP in Glasgow to show in practice what circular economy can deliver to combat climate change. We also had an excellent um, delegation at the Congress in Marseille on biodiversity and making sure that circular economy is seen also as a solution to fight uh, biodiversity uh, loss. So we do have a vibrant community uh, who can, we can mobilize also to give 
a say on public consultations on the future laws and regulations that we are designing at EU level. I would like to flag the importance of network governance also at international uh, level. Uh, we get a lot of interest European Union stakeholders who are looking at how we are doing and who are you know, getting also inspiration uh, as to what can be uh, done in their own uh, countries. And with the global alliance on circular economy and resource efficiency, we have been also building a new network uh, to have support uh, for a change at global level. This was also very much built on the experience we had with Sarkalan economy missions. So Europeans from businesses, citizens, politicians teamed up and did go to a number of uh, countries, key countries, to speak about Sarkalan economy and to meet with counterparts. And this has helped us also tremendously in pushing the Sarkalan economy in the forefront at international level. So, Professor Kramer, many thanks again for your book. No doubt it will be a source of inspirations to find how we can perform even better. And I would like to thank all the women and the men that are engaged in that circle on adventure to make it a success. Many thanks again. Thank you very much, Emanuele Maere. And it is so nice to have a support from the European Commission. And this collaboration is really flourishing. I must say, in uh, following all these years of our uh, work and of our endeavor to make circular economy the mainstream, uh, it really counts. So that we have different partners, different, um, let's say, organizations on one side, but also the support of the Commission, because only hand in hand we can move forward. And now we already uh, got the first question for Professor Kramer. So before we go on, I would like to raise the question, Professor Kramer, for you. And it refers to the model of Donut Economics by Kate Rapport. So the question is, uh, what is your opinion about that and how it can support cities? We know that uh, in Amsterdam you are applying this methodology, but maybe just briefly uh, how this concept fits into what you are exploring and uh, on what you are working on. It's perfectly. I, uh, I can say a lot about it, but that's my answer. And uh, it's, it's a, a very clear signal that we need to stick to the planetary boundaries and how we do that in the context of the social uh, economic parameters that need to be in place to make that work in, in that uh, planetary boundary context. So that's it. <laughs> Helpful. Thank you very much. And that's it what we need. Actually, we need different approaches. And then within these boundaries, we can then collaborate and really bring the solutions that are sustainable and are aligned with all these uh, boundaries that we should respect. So what we would like to do now is because uh, we have a great flow. Uh, so first we heard uh, about Professor Kramer and uh, the findings and the research and an insight, important insight in that what we can jointly do to build this circular future. Then from the side of Emanuele Maire, we've heard what the Commission is doing and what European Union is uh, really supporting on this very demanding journey. And now we will jump into onto the business side because it's important to understand why business and how business is recognizing the value of transition brokers as well as the, those who can support this transformation on the ground. So now I would like to invite uh, Ms. Daria Figel, who is uh, coming from Interserox Slovenia. So she is the general manager and she is someone uh, who is really uh, bringing circular solutions uh, in the field of, she will explain where or, but uh, where the value chains are actually changing. So, uh, Daria, please, um, the screen is yours, and we are looking forward to hear uh, your story. Daria? Um, hello, everyone. Um, 
Thank you for this kind invitation and opportunity to spread the word on circular practices in the EU. Um, I am uh, responsible for the management of the company Intercero in Slovenia. Our company was established uh, in year 2004. And since then, we have been actively contributing to preventing waste, uh, conserving resources and closing loops. Since the beginning, we have been recognizing the need for better resource management practices. And in more recent years, we've been developing tailor-made services for our customers, industry and country. There are a lot of challenges surrounding our work. The work with the waste stream that has huge impact on the environment and is the most challenging in terms of collection and recycling possibilities and that is household plastic packaging waste. Current trends show that plastic packaging is not going anywhere anytime soon. It's time that we start seeing household plastic packaging waste as another resource that we need to appropriately manage to reduce the, the future extraction of primary resources and the negative impact of plastic waste on the environment. Um, we are facing multiple challenges. So what are the challenges that surround our work? In Slovenia, household plastic packaging waste is separately collected in households and brought to the collection centers by municipalities where all sorts of plastic packaging are mixed together. From there on, EPR companies are responsible for household plastic packaging waste treatment and arrange its transportation, sorting, recycling, or in the worst case scenario, incineration. Unfortunately, incineration of household plastic packaging waste is also very common in Slovenia. Approximately 25% of household plastic packaging waste is actually used as a secondary resource the other 75% is incinerated and the value of the material lost. Important and huge barrier to the, uh, uh, to the implementation of circular practices is lack of transparency and access to data, for which reason we do not know exactly how much of specific packaging types is put on the market and how much of specific packaging types is collected, where and how um, on the market. Uh, or what can be even more worrying is there is no track to exclude possible irregularities on the field. Legislative barriers not fostering transparency and arranging monopolization. So addressing and tackling these complex challenges is one of our roles as a transition broker. Uh, we are known um, the, um, we know that man progress uh, because of specialization, but at same, the same point, the specialization must be integrated into a whole in order for a new solution, a new system, a new way of working to happen. So why, the, why are transition brokers important? In the field of recycling, we have come to this very crossroads when even more specialization, investment, new technologies are needed, and at the same time, connecting various specialized stakeholders into a complete whole that can ensure this. And someone, somebody has to orchestrate this. And that is why transition brokers are vital, and they are vital because he has to fulfill a wide variety of roles. He is entrepreneurial and dares to leave the comfort zone um, he has the ability to enthusiasm, inspire others to cooperate, and is pragmatic and connecting. What Transition Broker does? Um, we draft a program and present the idea to potential stakeholders, which are followed by the by idea being adopted. In the second phase, execute the program in which new partners join the implementation of circular economy practices, and that includes for example, connecting uh, different, sorry, 
connecting different entities, providing technical know-how and expertise, um, material insights to facilitate and create necessary precondition, preparation of legislative basis, for example, to moderate and coordinate meetings among different stakeholders, get a consent from a local and national authorities for a pilot or different collection methods, include know-how from other industries and from research and educational institution, for example, to find out what is the motivation for the correct or better or improved separate collection. By being invited to present at this conference, we also enter in phase three, where we communicate and inspire others based on the outcomes of implemented projects. For example, we also took part as a challenger in Climaton, we, um, per, um, where participants from different backgrounds had to think of the current challenges surrounding household plastic packaging waste and look for creative solutions. We also initiate, initiate out of the closed waste industry participants talks about resource management, system organization or legislative arrangements. Um, industry and example is closing loops donut with green plastic bottles. So to better illustrate our role as a transition broker, let me present to you one of the more recent project, a closing loop for food packaging material. Who are the stakeholders? Beverage producer who wish to create a new mineral water bottle made out of 100% recycled green pet, not collected in the deposit system an expert in the environment and production of innovative plastic packaging, waste sorters to supply sufficient quantities of post-consumer plastic packaging, plastic recyclers who segregate sorted post-consumer plastic packaging to suitable for recycling and not suitable for recycling, segregate by type of plastic, color, color of plastic, wash it, grind it, melt it, to a plastic flakes or granulate, and Interseroch as a transition broker and middleman who ensures sufficient supply of semi-finished product, green pet flakes, which is the resource for a new packaging. So with this project, we challenge the notion that as much as possible uniform plastic packaging is difficult or impossible for further use. We create a new market and demand for a specific stream of plastic packaging waste and contributed to higher recycling rates in the region and better management of resources. And what was really important and it is, is that we facilitate collaboration among different stakeholders. So for the conclusion, in reality, a lot of household packaging, plastic packaging waste collected in the EU is undesirable for future, future use as a current collection and treatment does not promise high returns. Consequently, this waste is often incinerated and resources lost. We recognize the need for better management of this resource, look for a new ways to create value within the chain and facilitate the implementation of circular practices. It should be spread to other food plastic packaging and also other household plastic packaging. But we need more collaboration and not, not exclusions. Faster response of local and national authorities in supporting and facilitating transparency and innovation, allowing development, development of new businesses and models interconnected industry collaboration and new knowledge. Interseroch acts as a middleman with an understanding of waste streams and contributes to the circular synergies of companies. Through our know-how and connections, we are able to ensure a sufficient and cost-effective supply of semi-finished products to all sorts of producers by orchestrating different stakeholders. As Henry Ford said, coming together is a beginning, keeping together is a process, but working together is a success. And all these are real roles of a transition broker. Without coming together, keeping together and working together, green pet, closed loop and other plastic open looks could not have 
uh, happened. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daria. It's so good to see how Transition Broker is operating on the ground. And you explained very well uh, why Transition Brokers are so much needed uh, to really um, design these new value chains and to maintain value wherever they can. So thank you very much. We will come back with questions, hopefully, at the end. And now we are moving to the last part of our session. And this is the panel discussion with four leaders of circular economy hubs uh, with different backgrounds, with different stories. So we have Arthur Tenvolde, Executive Director of Ecopreneur. We have Shadow Chen as a CEO of Circular Taiwan Network. Sarah Miller, Chief Executive Rediscovery Center from Ireland, and Frick van Eyck, Director of Holland Circular Hotspot, and of course, the co-chair of European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform. So first, Arthur, uh, we are giving the floor to you, since you are someone who have great overview of what is happening uh, with a circular economy hubs, and where are we still behind? So what is needed, where we stand, please, Arthur, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ladea, and thank you for this uh, opportunity to um, to tell something about um, yeah the vision of Ecopreneur, but also the activities of some of our members uh, to uh, create a circular economy uh, in Europe. Um, Ecopreneur, for those who don't uh, know us, is the political voice uh, of sustainable businesses in uh, Europe. Uh, we are the only cross-sectoral business organization at the EU level that is committed to bold policies that accelerate the transition uh, to a sustainable economy. That is our goal. We're also a member of the ESAS, uh, of the, uh, the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform since it was started. And via our seven member organizations that are depicted here in the middle, we uh, represent um, about 2,900 small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, and about 100 large companies. And uh, the uh, organizations are uh, representing those in, uh, in Germany, in France, Austria, the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, uh, Sweden, and also Estonia. And um, for instance, MVO Nederland in the Netherlands is not only representing 2,000 companies, but is also a transition broker themselves. By the way, Ecopreneur ourselves, we are the federation, so we're not a transition broker directly, but we have um, made a study of the whole topic already uh, almost three years ago um, to map all of uh, Europe, all the 20, well, the 28 <laughs> member states. Uh, we see that these are the countries that uh, were the farthest back uh, in 2019, and the differences are not so uh, so large. And what it also showed is that in many countries, there were already transition brokers, but they were small, they were poorly funded, uh, often lacking support from the governments and sometimes also from business. And uh, as uh, Professor Jacqueline Kramer indicated, those are some of the crucial uh, factors to make it a success. Um, and now, what we uh, did last year is that we think that one of the problems behind the whole lack of progress on this topic of uh, circularity at the regional level is that um, many people think that multinationals alone will make the difference to the circular economy because we need scale. Um, we think that is not the case because about 60% of the pollution in Europe, but also it seems to be globally, is coming from SMEs. So there can be no circular economy without SMEs. And this graph, and this graph, it's a bit complex to go fully into it. You can download the report uh, from our website, shows how we see the transition. On the one hand, um, we represent the front runners in the gray area that are trying to become larger, want to grow. And on the top, you see the, um, yeah, the conventional companies, SMEs and multinationals that want to, want to transform and have a turnaround to become fully sustainable. And this development is blocked. And um, I'm very worried, we're increasingly worried that it's not going fast enough. So I was very much in line with the, the message of uh, uh, Anna MacArthur uh, yesterday. We need to speed up and uh, the work of the European Commission is fantastic. Uh, and we know that they're working uh, overtime to do everything. And still, we ask them to refocus on SMEs and on economic incentives. And for the SMEs, what we need um, mostly um, is um, yeah, so to switch from, from product regulation 
only because it's insufficient. We need economic incentives. That means uh, we need um, to change the rules of the game of the economy uh, so that sustainable products and services actually become cheaper than uh, the linear ones. And this is now almost always not the case. But the second thing is that even if you want to become circular, it's very complex. And that's why we think that the other focus, like a new flagship, should be the creation of regional circularity hubs in all EU regions. And that means in, in Germany, that is, uh, what is it? I think six, 16, yeah, 16 uh, Bundesländer alone. So a lot of hubs. And then we uh, are of the opinion that the European Commission should take the lead and leadership and start the governance of these hubs. And of course, then the member states should match the funding because without the funding, they can uh, not function and they cannot help SMEs to how do you change your business model. And finally, we are also in favor of free vouchers, meaning a funding of maybe 5,000 or 15,000 euros for them to build their capacity. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, maybe one more remark. We also um, did a proposal for what all these hubs could do. So. Each hub could have various functions. There's a lot of things that a transition broker can do. And one of the previous, Daria already showed some of this. They can do uh, help collaboration and they can do advocacy to the government on what should happen in this member state. They could work on education, information and awareness. They could do business support and tools. And they can, of course, do EU collaboration. So this is a plea to the European Commission to do a new flagship and to take the lead in building circularity hubs in all EU regions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Arthur. Great message. And that is exactly what we need. So more hubs and also more support, as you said, and simple access to resources, including financial ones. And now we are moving to uh, another uh, part of the world, actually, to Shadow, who is coming from Taiwan and was included also in the research done by Professor Kramer. So Shadow, please, can you share your views from Taiwan and uh, with the global perspective on that, why we need circular economy hubs? Hmm. Thank you, Ladija and all. Uh, it's my honor and a pleasure uh, to be invited to this discussion and especially as the only representative outside uh, Europe. Uh, today, uh, my presentation, I, I try to answer um, the, the question you raised, why do we need a circular economy hub? I hope my experience from Taiwan uh, can um, help uh, with the, the understanding of the network governance. So I will move to the next slide. Okay. So here, before I uh, start with our approaches, I'd like to give you a um, brief introduction of the context of Taiwan, because we really think that Taiwan is uniquely positioned uh, for circular economy. Um, Taiwan is a strong global value chain player with 67% of our industry is connected to global value chains, including semiconductor industries, electronics, textile and bike industries. Um, but in order to uh, produce those uh, parts and components uh, for the global economy, actually, we need to import most of the resources for it. And um, on the as the side product, which is uh, used to go waste in the linear economy, um, Taiwan has developed a quite sophisticated way to deal with it. Thus, we uh, we achieved um, sixty percent of municipal solid waste recycling, and also eighty percent of the industrial waste recycling um, is achieved. So Taiwan. Uh, does have a very solid ground uh, for circular economy. However, what is the challenges? Um, the challenges ahead is how people can transit from the waste management mindset to circularity. That means includes circular materials, design, business model, reverse logistics, etc. And then the in the linear and industrial way that people often work in silos. So um, in order to be more efficient, the government bodies, it's separate in parts. So they rule different parties. 
Um, so that's we see the problem in um, the circular transition. And also in Taiwan, the industries, uh, because they sometimes only manufacture for just a component of it, thus um, their lack of the market insight, how the end users uh, are needed, what do they want um, in the circular transition. So in uh, Circular Taiwan Network, what do we do? First, we have a lot of communication programs in order to um, close the information gap and then to inspire people. So we have speeches and books and reports and articles on mainstream uh, magazines and um, channels. And then uh, for advocacy, we heavily involved in the policy intervention um, by sitting as the committee members or advisors of many um, circular economy related boards and funds, including recycling schemes. So that we can um, tackle the institutional barrier as well as create incentives for circular front runners. And then, but what essentially what we do is a network. So we have a um, platform called co-partner platform that has 40, uh, more than 40 com companies. So we bridge them together and help them to uh, work with each other. And we also host the largest Asia Pacific circular economy roundtable with more than 18 countries representatives joined. And also we have host a lot of international connection events such as delegation to the Netherlands, to Luxembourg, uh, France and to Japan. And also we connect to hubs like what we're doing now. And so what's the specialty, uh, what's a special approach uh, of us? First, circular economy is a complex issue, right? So when you, all, you have a lot of stakeholders, they have different best interests, they have different perspective. So what we take is we take a system thinking approach. So we use system dynamics to help people to map the hotspots of the system and then try to find the leverage points. So I think that's, uh, I would like to echo Professor Kramer's uh, research because that's how the hub is needed because we find the gaps in the system uh, with some methodologies and tools. And second, we try to develop um, scalable tools so that we can apply these capacity, uh, capacity building tools in different companies uh, with different stakeholders. That is a workshop tools that we have been uh, proven quite successful. And the last thing it's about, um, we call it focus on the 15% approach. So when you try to promote circular economy, a lot of people say, ah, oh, this is too hard, how to change the behavior of people, how to get everyone on board. But when you look at the nature, they don't change the system overnight as well, right? Unless there is a disaster. But in order to change a system, how can we learn from the nature? So look at the fish uh, picture I have in the background. Um, don't know if you have been um, scuba diving or snorkeling, but a group of fish, when they want to turn the directions, not all the fish turn together. Just the first 10 to 15% of the fish that's turning its way and the rest just follows. So in the center of what we do, we try to look for that 15% of passionate and knowledgeable uh, people and to work together to build that transition shift. So that's um, um, the approach what we use. So um, the, the, and then my last slide goes to the, um, our uh, advocacy for circular collaboration for climate crisis as the um, circular economy platform, uh, stakeholder platform. I think you can all agree with me, we cannot achieve net zero or tackle climate crisis without circularity. So that's what we call CC for CC. And here I'd like to invite you um, to uh, continue this discussion um, on the global supply chain and on the network level. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much, Shadow, and thank you for this inspiring uh, metaphor about the fish, because sometimes we as leaders of hubs get frustrated since we cannot change or involve more people. But as you said, 15% can make a significant change. Thank you very much for this. We will keep this in mind. And we are moving now to Sarah Miller. Uh, Sarah, please, uh, your uh, story and experiences that are really rich, please. Sarah, 
Sarah, are you with us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you and we can see you, please. Super. Thanks, Ladea, and thank you to the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, yes, my name is Sarah Miller, and I'm the Chief Executive here at the Rediscovery Centre. We are the National Centre for the Circular Economy in Ireland, and we're an environmental social enterprise that was established in 2004, late 2004, early 2005. We operate as a creative movement connecting people, ideas and resources to support the transition to a circular economy. And as a circular economy hub and a transition broker, our mission really is to support the development of fair, inclusive communities that thrive within the natural resource limits. We recently, um, oh, we recently completed a strategic review of our organi organizational activity, and this has provided us with a roadmap for our activities over the next five years. And I thought it just might be useful to share this work with you in the context of our current conversation, as it highlights where we believe our energies and efforts are best placed as a circular economy hub. We have four main outward facing goals, addressing education, demonstration, advocacy, and collaboration, topics which have been mentioned a lot over the past two days. Within our educational goal, the objective really is to empower individuals and communities with knowledge and skills and tools to embrace the circular economy. Our education and awareness raising activities takes many forms and many formats. We have very formal curriculum linked circular economy programs, which are delivered within primary, secondary and third level institutions. We also support curriculum development and professional development for teachers. And over the last uh, year, we've worked with, with around 75,000 students and teachers uh, through our education programs. Our non-formal and vocational skills training is delivered through social enterprise and through our national networks. And funding um, for the labour activation initiatives actually is provided through government supports also. Public engagement is aimed at, at supporting sustainable lifestyles, and that's provided through multi-channel programmes and platforms. We use digital communications, websites and newsletters, as well as in-person in targeted conversations, skills training, workshops and events. In terms of our demonstration goal, the main objective here is to inspire individuals and communities and social enterprises to adopt circular economy practices and to accelerate the circular economy in general. The circular economy is relatively uh, new as a concept and it can seem quite abstract in the absence of examples. And so our centre demonstrates opportunities for circular economy within the built, the natural and the cultural environments. And this acts as a tool for real citizen engagement. And it is through the centre's operation and activities and events, and through showcasing circular economy business models, social enterprises and innovation, through inter interactive exhibitions, through workshops, and these all really help to bring to life the circular economy. We also demonstrate the opportunity through our social enterprise activities and provide mentoring and support for other social enterprises and community based organizations through a national circular economy academy. And this is supported through a strategic partnership with the Environmental Protection Agency here in Ireland. Our advocacy work is centered around providing leadership and a consistent and credible voice, ensuring that evidence, insight and practical experience informs the policy development and its implementation. So this work includes conducting policy reviews and analysis, communicating circular economy policy and practice, stimulating impactful debate, and participating in high level coordination, advisory and technical groups. And all of this helps to shape and support the circular transition here in Ireland. Finally, our collaboration objectives are centred around delivering circular economy solutions by mobilising sectoral partnerships, networks and research collaborations. Within this objective, we work closely with civil society, government agencies, local authorities and academic institutions. Together, we deliver and explore best practice solutions, communication campaigns, events, and evidence-based research. 
And relevant, I suppose, to this conversation, 50% of our operations is funded through collaborative programs and strategic partners, partnerships like the one that we have with the Environmental Protection Agency and also with Dublin City Council. These multi-annual partnerships provide opportunity for long-term strategic thinking and co-creation of intervention, and they have been transformational for our organization. For us, they have resulted in increased and an expanded impact far beyond the ambitions of the partnerships themselves. They've led to increased staff numbers, productivity, and revenue. As a circular economy hub, we recognize the power of collaborative networks, such as the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform. And we actually believe that this is the key role of circular economy transition brokers and hubs, and that we need to be the actors that connect and build strong national and international networks. In that vein, I suppose, I'd like to conclude by reminding everyone here that in 2023, the circular, economy state, the circular Economy Hotspot will be hosted here in Dublin, and we look forward to welcoming you all here and to collaborating further on this circular economy journey. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you for encouraging us, uh, because uh, throughout your story, we can see how successfully and impactful a hub can develop. So thanks a lot. And who could be the better uh, speaker to somehow wrap up everything what we have heard so far about the hubs, about the impact of the hubs, about that what is still lacking, about that what Transition Broker can do. So I'm inviting Frick van Eyck uh, because he's also someone who has a significant role in the event that uh, now Sarah already announced that will take place uh, next year in Ireland. So the next circular hotspot. So Frick, you are a kind of a circular global diplomat. <laughs> and I'm really inviting you now to, to wrap it up and to share with us uh, your thoughts on that, what should be done and where we stand, please. Thank you so much, Ladeya. Too much praise and way too much pressure if I all of a sudden have to summarize this all. Uh, as you know, as Holland Circular Hospital, we are a little bit of a, a peculiar circular economy hub because we work at the international level and we really try to make circular economy happen at the international level by sharing the, the, the best practices from business, the insights from knowledge institutes and the hard learned lessons for governments. And while doing so, we notice that actually network governments works. It's happening everywhere. It's an instrument which we have to use way more and more often. And while listening to you all, I was trying to structure my mind a little bit. And we started with Jacqueline talking about network governments, talking about the role of circular economy hubs and the power of their work. Uh, she presented her 10 takeaways, uh, 10 takeaways which we all recognize very well. Um, but she also showed that these avenues uh, um, uh, are showing the eight avenues that show that circular economy basically can work everywhere, depending where you are depending on government leadership, business involvement, and the acceptance for network governance. So the good news is it can work everywhere. And exchanging uh, experiences and cooperation between countries uh, can accelerate the worldwide uh, transition to a circular economy, which we heard yesterday is so much, uh, is so much needed. Um, so I think our work is, uh, is crucial because we're catalysts, we're accelerated, we're trusted neutral brokers. Deliberately, I, I, I use some, uh, some other words here. Um, but I would say if I look um, as, a, as a tool for the Commission, our work is still, I, I would say, underutilized. We still seem to be in the nice to have corner and not in the must have corner. Uh, the wording uh, also this morning was very good, very positive on the roles, except for instance, but the action should follow. And time is not on our side, I think. Uh, we have heard from many speakers also these days. Um, Europe has big ambitions to be circular, inclusive, to increase resilience, to create jobs, to create business opportunities. We, like Shadow says, we are working on a, on a system change. We have to break down linear habits. We have to build new circular systems. And we can actually be the secret weapon, building bridges between all these actors, public, private, uh, act, consumers, within value chains, over the border, because nobody can do this alone. I think that we have proven in our own area, in Ireland, in uh, Taiwan, uh, 
uh, we have proven uh, that that the network governance and the role of hubs is important, that it's working. We're implementing change. We're creating a tipping point, maybe starting with the first 15%, but that's enough to get critical mass. Uh, we've also proven, I think, that we can work over the border like we're doing, like we're doing now. And that's important because it makes no sense to create a circular island of uh, Europe if the rest of the world goes around the drain. We have to keep on working and sharing our lessons. Now, uh, with these hubs, we have seen also today that there are many different flavors. Uh, there are public dominated uh, hubs like, for instance, Circular Flanders or there are private hubs like Ore uh, or the Nordic Circular Hotspot or public private hubs. There are knowledge hubs like Inovo. Uh, so the momentum or where you come from doesn't really matter. It's the approach which you have. And I was very pleased to see that companies also take this role because uh, the game is network governance, but uh, mostly circular economy hubs are doing this. But sometimes companies like Interzero are playing that role. And that's very important to know. And in short, I think uh, what we share today, that the work we do is very important and needs to scale up and we need more support. I think Arthur provided some very good uh, suggestions how hubs can be supported, either from the public side or the private side, maybe focus more on the SMEs, uh, maybe have a stronger emphasis on the power of economic instruments. But if we are supported, we can do our work better and create impact and then we can do our activities, which is networking, joint, uh, uh, joint advocacy, sharing best practices, mapping the potential, identifying priority sectors, initiation projects, sharing the knowledge and capacity building or creating access to finance for for new startups so uh we do good work i think we should we need a little bit more recognition and by sharing i think uh, one plus one can be three and with that i give the word uh, the floor back to you ladea Thank you very much for this excellent wrap up. Uh, I enjoy being in the tandem with you because it really works so well and the messages you shared. So now I would like to invite our audience again to contribute to the poll number two. And we are raising the question uh, based on what Frick just uh, summarized so nicely. So what do you think would help to get circular hubs off the ground across the EU so what is needed? Here you have different options because as we have heard, we have to speed up, but we also need support. So it's up to you now to decide what you find most important. And we will then uh, take a look at the results. And in the meantime, I would like to ask our uh, speakers, our panelists, just for a brief, because uh, we have only five minutes left, just the final thought on that. What is that one thing that you see is the most important to speed up and to really make hubs even more impactful. So to start with Professor Kramer and then we go uh, in the road as we were. So please, uh, just one thing, because we have to be really uh, fast. Professor Kramer, can we start with you? I think that the support of the EU for funds is, is one of the main points I want to make. Uh, we have Emanuele with us still. Emanuele, where do you see the uh, thing that is needed? I, I very much uh, enjoyed um, the image as you did, uh, Ladeya, from the Taiwanese representative, uh, you know, on, on the number of fishes. So I think we really need to connect much more uh, to everybody who is engaged in the Sankanon economy. So multiplying, you know, the um, connections on the social media to bring more awareness of what is available is for me absolutely crucial. If we don't have this, then we cannot spread, you know, the news on the EU funding, on different initiatives, on, on good practices. So we need to enlarge the network. Thank you. Enlarging the network and we are moving to Daria. So from your perspective, what is needed to make hubs even more impactful? Um, yeah, I come from the private sector. I would add to all what we also hear that uh, we need really more innovations. And from my experience, the, the most of innovate, innovative energy comes from small and medium-sized companies. So in this sector, they are somehow, I would not say neglected, but they have very, 
they have a lot of difficulties really to to start their business to to cooperate so SMEs focus on SMEs right yeah uh, we are moving to Arthur and then quickly shadow Sarah Frick <laughs> Thank you. And of course, I'm very glad that Daria pointed out that SMEs uh, are not only part of the problem, but also of the solution. And so I very much agree with that. And I think that direct funding from the European Commission uh, would be needed to make the real change. But then again, when they become active, that these regional hubs show to the national governments what they can do and how economically fruitful it is uh, so that the governments will step up as well. Arthur Shadow. Hey. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think for me, the most important thing is that everyone can show and demonstrate leadership uh, from the networks, but also from the government, from the private sectors. And so here in Taiwan, we like to be that 15% of the fish and we would like to uh, really help to organize and uh, coordinate supply chains in this uh, global circularity. So that's uh, we're trying to organize dialogues um, maybe uh, toward the end of this year, um, more Asia and Europe and Asia uh, level. So I highly e invite you, uh, like-minded people, to join us, to be that 15% of the fish. Thank you. Okay, Sarah, your message? Yeah. Well, obviously, the funding is really important. And also, I think knowledge share through these collaborative networks is a really important part. Um, but also I would like to see some strong circular economy targets to really create the demand for the circular economy at a national level. Thank you. And Frick, the last word goes to you. Thank you so much. Well, I think government sets the, the ambition and creates the boundary conditions, but in the end, businesses uh, are the main actors to, to scale up. And yes, most innovation and let's say ideas come from the small companies, but in the end, we also need the big companies with value chain power also to scale up. But the party that brings them together is actually us as circular economy hubs, with our network governance approaches. And uh, if I would summarize what's needed most, I would say leadership at all these levels, uh, leadership from government to set the ambition and the targets and the indicators and to fund hubs like, uh, like ours, but also leaderships uh, from businesses uh, um, so I keep it with leadership at this moment. Thank you. Good. Uh, since the leadership is also something what we started with, with Professor Kramer and 10 takeaways for global change makers. So the leaders and change makers, that is what we should be. And to conclude with the results of the poll. So what uh, you find most relevant is clear local circular economy objectives and government support. So that was, that, uh, was voted as the most important thing. And I would like to thank you all for this really, really insightful um, presentations and uh, discussion and contribution. Uh, we will keep uh, you updated. Of course, stay uh, tuned and uh, let's collaborate in the spirit of speeding up circular transformation, not only in Europe, but on the global level with the true collaborative leadership. Thanks a lot and uh, wishing you all the best in these super challenging times. Thank you.